That's the one side of the line. There is another side, though. Let's write it down, too. The other side says, what? Humans are not inherently evil. What is wrong with you? Humans are inherently good. Okay? Good, inherently good. Right? Go watch a bunch of uh, four-year-olds playing in a sandbox. Funny thing. Don't seem to care very much about the color of the skin of the other kids in the box. Right? They just play together. They don't seem to care about how much money the other one has. They don't seem to care about what size of the house they live in or the cars that they drive. They could care less about their political persuasions. They don't care about what church they go to. They're four-year-olds. They're playing with Legos in a sandbox. Why do they get along so well? Because by nature, humans are not at all nasty and brutish and evil. We come to all of that. Why is it that humans behave this way, evil, nasty, fallen? Because of a bad education or a bad society. This argument says, look, here's the deal. If you, if, if, if you really follow it, the reason that we all walk the halls of war in high school and we worry about being nasty to each other is because of fear. The reason we fear each other is because we, we've been taught to fear each other. It wasn't because we were naturally this way, it's because we were taught this way. A poor education will lead to a bad kind of person or society. These people then will say, these are social reformers, you can imagine, they will say, look, if you want people to behave a certain way, then educate them to behave a certain way. If you want them to be nice to each other, teach them how to be nice to each other, and more particularly, model how to be nice to each other, and then kids will, in fact, be able to do that. Now, there's some other terms I need in your notes for these two different views, because this is such an important paradigm that we come back to over and over again in our study. Often, on the left-hand side, this view is often defined as realism, okay? Realism. As opposed to Mr. Brown on the other side, what we will call later idealism, okay? Idealism. Realism, idealism. On the right-hand side, all humans are inherently good. Another bit of language that we use here is often we will call the, the, the side we call realism, often we will see it as more pessimistic, okay? Pessimistic versus Mr. Ramos on the opposite side of the line. The opposite of pessimism would be optimism. Excellent. Optimistic, right? <laughs> optimistic, correct, okay. Now, let's put it in your notes. The history of philosophy, the way we think about the great ideas of the world, is in large measure a tension between these two views, okay? A tension. Are humans inherently evil, nasty, fallen, brutish, yucky? Or are humans inherently good, but somehow corrupted by a society that becomes, you know, less than positive? It's a tension, back and forth, back and forth. Now I'm ready for the final moment in an introduction to Romanticism. Hurrah! Now this is very simple. I can tell you, Romantics are individuals who do this. Are you watching the whiteboard? Romantics say, about this view of human nature, garbage. Why? Well, this is a knockdown argument. I hope, I hope those of you who are, are certain that the world's a pretty nasty place, you're going to have to deal with this, this question then. Why have schools? Why have schools? <laughs> right? I mean, right? I mean, why educate someone if you don't believe they can change? See, romantics, are you ready for this? Romantics will hold to this view. We call these guys romantics. Ooh, I'm going to see who was listed last year as juniors. If you're in the American tradition, we didn't call them romantics last year, but we called Emerson, Thoreau, Whitman, not romantics, although we could have. We call them what? Do you remember the term? Started with a T. Transcendentalist. You got it. Transcendentalist. Although, let's point out, Emerson himself, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the founder, a supposed founder of American transcendental thought, he did not like the term transcendentalism. He actually, Mr. Judice, liked the term idealism. 
That's the term he liked better. He didn't even like the term optimism. He liked the term idealism for reasons we'll get into later when we study Wordsworth and Tintern Abbey, okay? So, romantics. Individuals who want to look at the human condition in a more hopeful, optimistic, idealistic view. But notice, this view emerges out of a time of great transition and revolution. That kind of makes sense. So the great poet Wordsworth will say it this way. The world is too much with us late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. That same guy wrote these lines. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. He says, I get totally happy when I see a rainbow. Oh, look, a rainbow. Right? Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Back to my model on the board, right? Oh, look, a rainbow. Yeah, go back to sleep. It's a long ways for our trip to be over. This might be what we would say to a child, right? Enough with rainbows. Go back to sleep. We don't need to hear from you. The romantic view is a view that will celebrate the view of a child. So was it when my life began? So is it now I am a man? So be it when I shall grow old or let me die. Word, uh, Wordsworth says, if I ever come in my life to a moment where rainbows don't totally jazz me, I hope I just die. Now wait a minute. Somebody who's working on the other side of the of the line here would say to Wordsworth, dude, what is wrong with your head? Rainbows? Rainbows got nothing to do with money. Rainbows got nothing to do with power. What is wrong with you? Wordsworth isn't done. He's the great poet of philosophy in the most simple of language. The child is father of the man. For those of you who have that poem, you maybe are looking at those lines now in front of you. The child is father of the man. Well, now, wait a minute. Mr. Harder has a father. We understand the relationship between the two of them. There is him. There is his father. We would say, Mr. Harder, young Harder, Master Harder would be the, the, uh, the English way of saying this. Yes? We understand. Go back and look at the line now. I'm going to blow the minds of some of you. Wordsworth says, are you ready for this? Now you can look at the lines. Young Harder is the father of his father. Go back and look at it again. The child, young harder, the child, young harder, is father of the man, old harder. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Some of us are saying, wait a minute, what's words worth saying? In what way is young harder ever a teacher to old harder? And I remember a senior once saying this out loud. She said, we were studying this poem relatively close to graduation. This will be a strange thing for you as a senior. As you move towards the months of April and May, strange things will start to happen psychologically for you as you begin to kind of see things differently. And one of the things this young student said was, I think I understand what this line means. The child is father of the man. She said, my ma and I, we've been like this lately. We're five weeks out from graduation. It occurred to me the other night, she said, student says this out loud, our parents raise us for a while, and then we turn around and raise them. Right, Ralph Lutner, and a lot of my students made that very face right. Holy crap, that's happening right now. My dad actually thought he had control over me, power over me, and when I was young, he did. But guess what? It won't be long, and I'm getting old. Now I'm older the relationship starts to change and pretty soon, are you ready for this? There are things the only way your parents can ever learn them is for you to teach them. Uh -huh. That is true. <laughs> that is absolutely true. But guess what? Hello? Hello? It doesn't end. You turn around and the process will start over again, either with your own biological children or the children who you will be around as you get older. Right? There will be, in all of your lives, children who will raise you. They will finally ask you a question you can't answer. 
They will want to know information. You can't give because you got no answer. And in that moment, Wordsworth comes back. The child is father of the man. Children understand rainbows better than adults because we have a tendency to forget. It is a profound romantic insight. The stuff we knew as kids, we have a tendency to forget, and that is tragic. Last line of the poem, a total romanticism. I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. Piety means to live a pure life, a good life. We're back to romanticism again. Thank you.